I think is so critical, which is that there are, you know, these choices don't live in a vacuum, right? They're either women themselves putting themselves up for it, you know, sending letters saying, here, 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 I'm here. Or, you know, as we see today too, there's there's a lot of outside influence that can happen to, you know, put someone on a short list or persuade an administration to consider someone. I'm curious, in your research, did you find these, not only the, ju the ju women judges themselves, but the public at large asking to see more, more diverse candidates for judges or for what we would consider today kind of interest group um, putting forth people as well? Yes, so yes to all of that. Individual authors were writing. There were also not just uh, typed up letters, but tons of telegrams going back and forth, which was very funny because I mean, the idea of using a telegram now is so tons of like the carbon paper that I would go through. Interest groups for sure were coalescing, pushing lots of correspondence from senators as well, urging presidents. And each president handled their selection process a little bit differently. Um, you know, I think that going forward, I would love to see a process that looks more like the Carter process, which was very transparent, not in terms of who was being considered, but the qualifications and the process for how they were being considered. But absolutely, the um, letters were pouring in. Interestingly, and maybe surprising to some people, for both O'Connor and Ginsburg. So the book focuses on the stories of nine women who were officially considered before O'Connor, but then we also cover the other women who show up on Reagan's subsequent shortlist, because he had more than one opportunity to put a woman on the court, but he, he checks that box with O'Connor. And then not only does he not select one of these other incredibly qualified women to join her on the court, but he goes on to put hardly any women into the federal judiciary at all. And in fact, toward the end of his time of his second term, his record had been so bad that there was a congressional inquiry into the lack of diversity and during Reagan's presidency. But one thing that really surprised me were the number of letters that would come in commenting on the president's choices once women were selected. So with O'Connor, they would keep a tally in the White House Correspondence Office of how many letters in support and how many against. And there were more letters against than in support, but fortunately Reagan didn't let that make his choice. Uh, and similarly with Ginsburg, we think of her as this feminist icon, and, and rightly so, but at the time there were women's groups who felt that she might not be sufficiently committed to women's rights in the way that they had hoped. And so one thing that has been helpful to me in watching these Supreme Court nominations that have played out, not just the recent one, but we were finishing writing this book in the midst of the Kavanaugh hearings. It was quite a juxtaposition to be listening to Christine Blasey Ford testify as we were writing about Anita Hill's testimony and kind of finishing up the, the loosens of this book. But one thing that uh, has consoled me through all of this is learning this history reminds me of um, how intense something can be in the moment, having the big picture perspective, I think can be helpful. And the other thing that I found that's very helpful about writing this history is that often when an issue feels too controversial or divisive to talk about it right now in real terms, you could talk about that same issue, for example, lack of diversity in one's workplace. If you discuss it in the historical context of the things that happened to these women, it removes some of the defensiveness and allows for a more productive conversation. Um, I can just give one quick example of that with uh, talking about another woman from our shortlisted sisters, as we call them. Her name was Soya Menchikoff. And she was the second woman to be officially considered by President. LBJ put her on his shortlist. Kennedy also considered her. She was the first female law professor at Harvard Law School, the University of Chicago, first female dean at the University of Miami, formidable legal mind, not much of a feminist. She, uh, you know, was certainly not a, a, an activist in the way Florence Allen was, for example. She also became the first woman to be the president of the Association of American Law Schools, which is a, a professional organization 
all law schools belong to it. And like any professional organization, there's an annual meeting every year, lots of networking happens. It's where one can receive awards and recognition for their writing, maybe potential job opportunities. And she noticed that women were not showing up to this annual meeting. And so she asked why. And she found out it was because the meeting was held the day after Christmas through New Year's. And so women who are home with children who are home from school could not up and leave their kids. So she changed the timing of the meeting. It was very simple. You know, she wasn't uh, out campaigning for women's rights. She uh, didn't really support the Equal Rights Amendment. But something as simple as changing the meeting time, that enabled many women to then attend and, and even me. So I attended with my co-author very early in our academic career. We won a writing award for that media study I talked about at the beginning of our time. And we did that while we were raising toddlers. And if she hadn't changed the timing of the meeting, I don't think that we would have been able to participate. And we might not have gotten to the point in our careers where we could even write this book. And so talking about that history to illustrate modern ways right now in real time that decision makers and leaders can make small changes to level the playing field for women without asking women to do more, to lean in or dress this way or be this way is something really important. And I have found being able to talk about this book's history has allowed me to maybe open up some more minds than I might have been able to otherwise. Well, and I think having that open dialogue is actually how change happens, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I love about this book is, is that the theme, I think, really hits home with me, which is that it's, it's not enough to shortlist women. You actually have to select them. You actually have to be intentional about your actions and pick them to lead if you're in those positions of power. And you offer, with your co-author, some strategies for women to move off of that shortlist and you, know, you just talked about something as simple as changing a meeting time to you know, give greater space for people with families or outside obligations. Can you share any other strategies that you included in the book? Sure, so uh, I'll talk about a couple more. Um, we don't have time to, to do all of them, although I'd love to, because I, uh, again, when we got to that point, it's not something that we ever set out to do in writing this book. And, and it was kind of a, a difficult part of this process. So. You know, we aren't historians by training. Uh, I had written a lot as a law professor, but this was trying to write for a much broader audience. Wanted to do justice to these women's stories that hadn't been told, but also in some ways, especially the second half of the book is almost like an airport read. I mean, it's just filled with all kinds of juicy details about their lives. And we even interwove some aspects of our own lives. And then the end of the book, coming up with these strategies, we, in some ways, we're a little bit reluctant because we don't want to suggest that, like, if you follow our eight strategies, suddenly you'll, you'll be a Supreme Court justice or we'll have a court of all nine women or that suddenly there's going to be a magic one-size-fits-all solution. That's, that's just not the case. But we also felt that we had learned these important lessons. We had to share them. And so uh, one of them I, I've talked about, thinking about, you know, even something as simple as changing the timing of a meeting comes to us from Soya Menchikov. Another is the way Carter handled his judicial selection process. That's something that anyone who's in a decision-making process for who becomes a leader can implement. So uh, a couple more just quickly. One, uh, we talk about collaborating to compete. So a woman that we I haven't mentioned yet, her name was Joan Dempsey Klein. She was a judge in California, and she was among the women shortlisted when O'Connor was selected. So for Reagan's shortlist, it was a shortlist of all women. I suppose if you want to make sure that a woman comes off the shortlist, if it's all women on the shortlist, then you will have a woman. I, I can't imagine what it must have been like for her to come so close, to know that it was almost her. But I have to think there was a range of emotions that she experienced. But rather than you know, sort of picking up her toys and going home, she actually stepped forward and championed O'Connor at her confirmation hearing, she testified on her behalf. And not only did she talk about O'Connor's qualifications and that she deserved to be on the court, but she also talked about how very difficult it was going to be for O'Connor to be the first woman on the court and the concerns that follow tokenism that can, that can occur and the pressure she would be facing and would be feeling. And so 
I think that's a really important reminder. Again, we try to resist giving women a list of things. Women need to do more. Like if you just do these things, then you'll suddenly be the right magical leader to fit into a box that frankly was probably designed by a man and that we will never fit into. But that is one way where we felt through lessons we learned from the women in this book. That's a very specific one, but time and again, they were coming together to collaborate, to compete for these roles. And I think another important lesson to take away, and, and this one in some ways seems very obvious, but it is something they all had in common. They all went to law school. They all pursued law degrees at a time where, and I've read the, the oral histories for many of them, and they, they wanted to pursue a profession. Many of them were counseled to become teachers, a more traditional female job, and not to knock teachers. We need good teachers. I am a teacher but they chose a different path. One that was at the time really not open to women at all. And lost, there were law schools that, that still banned women from admission, let alone the issues with employers not having bathrooms and the like. And by pursuing their law degree, not only were they able to carve out a meaningful professional life for themselves, but they were also able to chart a legal path for women to pursue professional roles going forward. And then I think the last thing I would be remiss if I didn't mention a huge lesson and another strategy that we include at the end is for a more deliberate and intentional focus in this country on childcare. For every single woman in the book, it, in their oral histories, they would talk about that being the biggest challenge for them if they had children, or several of them did not. And some of them didn't comment publicly about that choice or even in their oral histories about it, but one did. Susie Sharp, I mentioned her earlier, the first female justice on the North Carolina Supreme Court. She would give the advice quite publicly that women could choose professional life or motherhood, but they couldn't do both. Mm -hmm. And of course we reject that and an important strategy going forward. And I think something that everyone can relate to when we look at the numbers of women who have had to step out of professional life in the midst of this global pandemic is to think about how we can engage in meaningful structural change to support the caregiving that is so desperately needed for young children. You know, I think um, that last point is, is so important because it, I think up until this pandemic and hopefully moving forward, we've kind of undervalued um, both really in the pay that childcare workers are, are the pay that they earn, but then also just the importance and the underpinning that they provide for our society to be able to help dual income families, you know, make it work and especially help women make it work. You know, I remember a time when you would see women leaders or women professionals, you know, share photos of them with their very young children, you know, sitting on their laps, maybe voting uh, on legislation or working at a desk. and. There was a moment where that felt like a sense of pride. You know, I even did it myself with my newborn. Um, you know, he's on my chest and I'm working away. And looking back on even that photo and those photos now of women leaders, it's not a sense of pride. It's a sense of why are we why are we putting women in the position where they're forced to literally care for their child at the same time that they're doing their job. You know, we really, I think, have to have a conversation about childcare, and hopefully, this crisis has, has um, shown a spotlight, as it has on so many issues that need attention. 